Oh, this is the Dropping In Surf Show. My name is Rob Case. I'm a paddling coach. Uh, today is May 27th, 2020, I think. <laughs> Pretty think so. sure. Yeah, there yeah. you go. 27th. That's why, I have a right. That's why I have a co-host. Keep me on track. <laughs> um, and we're recording from Belmarine Keys and Green Bay, California. With me is Jim Segelnik, Doctor of Physical Therapy. Jim, I was wearing these headset, this headset for you, man. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, you make me feel a little bit better about my uh, DJ Skrilla thing I got going here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get why you get... So every time we get on like a coach's call for like our upcoming summit, these guys are making fun of me because of my headset. And it's, it's just a normal USB headset. What's, well, what's so crazy about it? I think we do that because we're insecure. <laughs> and, and deep down, uh, yeah, we're a little envious of what you got going on. So I mean, I, it definitely looks like I can control airplanes and air traffic control or <laughs> or be at a DJ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You look like you're um, really into some, uh, what's the computer game kids play these days? Oh, Minecraft, man. Fortnite. Minecraft or Fortnite. Yeah, yeah you look all like, of that. You look, you look like you're really good at Fortnite. Jubilation dance, <laughs> right? I get all that through my kids, man. I'm all in. I got an Xbox account. Uh, yeah, like a gamer tag. So when man. I play with them. <laughs> man, you're blowing my mind right now. Yeah, it's just a, you're just a few years off. I was, I was going to say, like, I, I'll, in five years, come back to me. I might yeah. know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Minecraft Minecraft's a really fun one because they can build. And, dude, they come up with the most elaborate stuff. Uh, I, I can't wait until the kids really get into surfing if they ever do. I want to see them build, like, a big old huge wave or something, like a barrel. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. That would be – maybe I'll do that next time I, I hang with them. I'm just going to go off to the side and make a wave, guys. Well, your kids have surfed a little bit. Right? Yeah, but they don't. They do it because they know I like it, but mm. they don't do it. Uh, at least, at least my eldest does. My youngest loves body surfing. He's like, screw mm. the board. I'm like, sweet. Let's get back to the roots. Yeah, that's like you. Yeah, yeah, he loves it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's been pretty fun. How's your week been? It's been really good. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can't complain too much. Yeah. Um, more clinic, uh, more clinic work, which is good. Um, things are looking like they're going to maybe pick back up a little bit towards normal where I start seeing in-person patients again, which will be good because it's, uh, it's so unusual. It's been like 10 weeks or so since I've seen a real person in the clinic. So, um, looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. wild. I'm, I'm opening up in person, uh, June 1st, mm. even though technically in Marin, I, Probably could have pulled off uh, May 22nd, five days ago. But, you know, we're not ready. Like, I'm getting antibacterial wipes. I'm getting new hand soaps. We're, we're setting up just a way that we can social distance. I'm, I've gotten rid of, at least for now, the small group sessions. And we're just doing one-on-one -on -one so that we can mm -hmm. social distance effectively. And, um, yeah, this past weekend, we tested social distancing on the boat. So, yeah, how'd that go? It went great. Yeah, I, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the invite, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I I figured, you know, if uh, if I'm going to have anyone out there, it should be someone in the medical field. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys weren't foiling, were you? No, we were not. We were not. Okay. No, I just I boat surfed for uh, about 20 minutes, and mm. it went really well. So the social distancing thing is going to be work out great. Um, we're going to be able to have Instead of our regular four surfers at, uh, on the boat, we'll be able to have three surfers socially distanced. Not a problem. It's all outdoor. It's all good. Um, so it's actually better for them. Uh, well, I don't know if it's better for them because here's the thing with four. Four was perfect because you go for your run. You're like 10, 15 minutes in, right? And then you've got like 45 minutes to rest. And you know that you want that 45 minutes to rest mm -hmm. for sure uh so with three they really only get 30 minutes to rest and by round three they're going to be toast mm. um, we only did two rounds and i was 
I was pretty much shot. My right leg was definitely shot. That's that was the mm. injured one, uh, mm. and I and I, I had to text you. I said, I said, man, I f- I felt and I heard my foot crack like like knuckles, like you know, snap cracking your knuckles. And mm-hmm. I was like, Jim, it felt okay, but is this a good or bad thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question. Um, well, did it feel good or bad when it happened? It felt great. It felt like it was almost like a relief. Like, mm. um, I, I was trying to, to to think about whether I had felt it before, and I had. Um, when I took my carver board out uh, this last week just to get a couple reps in, whenever I would compress, and as I came out of com- uh, compression into extension, um, I would push on that back foot, and I would feel it tense. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't crack, though. It was like... It was on the verge of cracking, but it, it almost like it wasn't enough force for it to mm. crack. Mm-hmm. But behind the boat, I started out um, with just my regular short board, and then I went down to like a 4.8, um, where you have to work a lot more. Um, and man, did my right foot feel it then. Like it was, it was hot, it was working, like all the muscles were working over time. I feel like the, the just being on water made it work that much more more than being on just the carver board which is Mm -hmm. still challenging balance as well so i don't that's my take on it what do you think like from your perspective yeah i think it sounds about right um it's um not a dangerous thing that you experience it's kind of like a knuckle that needs to crack right like most people that need to crack a knuckle they like they do it it pops it feels good and usually what that is is just tightness releasing so I think what you experience, I love the way you describe it, like like on a carver board, how you you compress and extend, and it almost feels like the foot is, the, you, for the viewers that can't see us, Rob's kind of stretching out his hand, and, and my uh, PT mind goes, ah, oh, he's going from pronation to supination. So essentially it's like a spring. If the foot's a spring, it's going from like a stretch to a shortened position. And that, what we call a stretch stretch shorten cycle is is like one of the most unique ways a body can generate force and the uh like we've talked to a little bit about in the past one of the prereqs for that is you need joint mobility and so um when when things crack and feel good like something's released i mean that's all that really is is um joints getting um kind of challenged with a quick stretch yeah and in the cavitation which is the noise which is like the i don't know if you picked that up on my mic but that was me cracking my knuckles sorry for uh those squeamish people out there um (laughs) that's that's all that is that it's just noise um and so there's been some uh uh ultrasound studies looking at that um, where they've done it in um, toe joints, uh, the metatarsal phalangeal joints, which is, we talked about your MTP joints. And they actually provide um, kind of like a traction or what's called a distraction force, which is like just kind of pulling on the joint to create a cavitation sound. And what they've seen is actually um, air bubbles um, actually moving within the joint. And our, our best sense is all that is, is like, um, uh, it, it, it's just a gas exchange from a pressure differential, no different than like if you opened a can of soda and it made that when you, when you, um, open the soda, that's just high pressure moving to low pressure, making sound, you know, so kind of a normal, like physiological phenomenon that happens in normal joints and maybe, happens more so in tight joints and um that's probably what you did is you just challenged your foot heard some pops felt good to move and i'm curious did you get sore after no well i mean my body was sore i mean i i it was sore i had been training on uh basu ball and indo board Mm. and trampoline up leading up to this and then carver board but um, nothing worked it quite like the actual surfing. I mean, because that was the mm. first time I've surfed since December. Mm. Uh, and uh, I love how you talked about 
uh, the difference in pressure from high to low. I mean, mm-hmm. we should just rename this show like the pressure show or something because we've been talking about differences in pressure all over the place. Yeah, um, you know, I've been I've been thinking uh, we don't really have a theme song like other podcasts. <laughs> they 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 intro with a song, and maybe we can get like Queens Under Pressure kind of kind of going because like we seem to talk about pressure differentials quite a bit. <laughs> Quite a bit, quite a bit. <laughs> more so than I, yeah, more so than I ever thought we would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I never knew that that's what cracking the knuckles was. Yeah, that's I think crazy. That, yeah, I think that's kind of like maybe our best. Um, like we, I think that's also been a theme. It like depends, but um, that that's probably the best idea of what's happening physiologically, and 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 you know, I think that's probably the most appropriate way to think about it and describe it. And I say it like that because I'm so accustomed to um, like people's belief systems. Um, and, and, and what I mean by that is sometimes I work with people that have been told, hey, I'm going to make this joint crack, right? And mm-hmm. there might now be a belief of what's happening. And some of those like what I refer to as maladaptive beliefs, which are like beliefs that I that we believe might be bad for our psychology when we reference the biopsychosocial model is maybe something's popping back into alignment. Maybe I was, um, uh, had bad alignment or something was misshaped or this person realigned me. All those kind of different theories, um, most likely are not happening except in maybe, maybe rare cases where like, you dislocate a shoulder and it's pretty obvious there's what we call frank dislocation where something's out of joint and then you go to the ER and the ER doctor has to put it back in and there might be a thunk or pop that comes with that. Right. But it's pretty commonplace for be- people to be able to get their necks cracked, their backs cracked, their toes cracked and, and those kind of things and it feels kind of good. And, um, and more often times than not, that's all that is, is either a normal joint making noise or a tight joint that got challenged and also made noise and either way it usually feels relieving or good and um and that's it you know it's that it's that simple but like where it becomes a problem is uh maybe now okay now i'm visualizing something going back into position and now i need that dependent relationship with another individual to continuously do that because now i believe that's a healthy thing to do and, and what that sometimes can inadvertently do if that cycle, go, cycle goes on chronically is it can ironically make that area that's getting cracked feel more sensitive if it doesn't get cracked. Wow. You know, so you can kind of see like where I might take stance with um, that kind of like passive treatment that's like kind of like a dependent model, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and I say that not to like offend chiropractors, but I'll say that to anyone that does a sole passive treatment. That's chiropractors, um, uh, physical therapists, whomever that are doing that for people or to people and then ex- explaining it in such a way that makes that client now dependent on me. Right. And not following that up with some sort of physiological training like strength training and that kind of thing. If 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 you're seeing a practitioner and he or she, he or she is just lie, laying their hands on you and maybe cracking your body and convincing you to come back indefinitely without showing you exercise, that, in my opinion, is um, not a very good cycle to be in. Interesting. Yeah. I've always, I've always felt like in my life I try not – to become addicted to really any one thing. And I think it's hard. I think we we are creatures of habit mm-hmm. and those habits are developed way faster than we think. And I've, I've kind of always thought about that uh, when it comes to health. Um, obviously, there are. I think there are good addictions or I guess, mm-hmm. I don't know if there are good addictions. There are, yeah, I would say good addictions. Like one mm-hmm. addiction I'm getting on right now is conditioning my body back up mm-hmm. and um you know it's it's tough it's tough to actually make it to that point where it becomes addictive and consistent um like for example this morning uh, you know just this last week i i increased my the intensity of my exercise 
Um, now I'm going more towards my X swim format, whereas before it was just kind of foundational movement, you know, building a base foundation, and now I'm really stepping up intensity. And today was my second day, and dude, I almost didn't wake up. I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, if I just get, if I can just hit the water, I'll be good. And yeah. I almost, I basically just fell in the water and just went. And I have a, a general rule after if you can get through three to four days in a row, it for me at least, it becomes an addiction at, at day five. Mm. Like it becomes way easier to wake up and go. It's day three is when like day one you're super excited to just be back. Day two, you're a little tired, but you still are excited. Day three is the day where you're like, wake up and you're like, oh, you know, I just, maybe I'll just take a break today. It's all good. I worked hard for the last two days. I'll take a break. And you, you lose that consistency. You lose that habit. You lose that, that kind of snowball effect. And inevitably it's like one day on, one day off. Then it's two days off. Then it's like four days off. And then you're back at the beginning again. So my, for me at least, I need to get through day four. And if I get through day four, I'm good on habit uh, for exercise. And that's yeah. kind of where I'm at. So check back in two days. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. I don't know, maybe this is semantics, but that just sounds like buying into a good habit. Yeah. Not an addiction. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe maybe it's a not a good addiction then. Maybe it's yeah. just habits. Maybe it's just habits. Well, that's maybe a, a totally separate existential conversation. Is <laughs> can an addiction be considered good? Or right? a hab- just a habit. Like, is is surfing an addiction, and is that a healthy addiction, or do you sacrifice other things in your life doing it, calling it a good thing for yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I actually wrote a blog post on is surfing addictive. Oh yeah. And and what I and this was like like three or four years ago. So if you, you have to really search back I'll have to my, read that, yeah. Own. So just put in addiction in a search and I think it'll pull up. But basically I went all the way back to my psychology class and I pulled up mm. Maslow's uh, oh. hierarchy of needs. Mm-hmm. And I just kinda went through each one of those and I was like, check, check, check. Check. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh oh. Check. Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah. Check. And then I was like, "Well, I'm not addicted. I'll, I'm going to go surf." <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and I think that's like the the total normal addicted surfer thing to say, right? Like, we'll justify surfing for any reason, and um, and that's not a problem, right? But if you if you replace that, and this is such a tangent, so I apologize. We, <laughs> We, we might be losing viewers. That's our, That's actually our new <laughs> show name is Tangent. We're just yeah. going to keep... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but if you replace that word surfing with drugs, right? And you said, okay, like I make all these sacrifices uh, to do drugs yeah. because it makes me feel good. Yeah. You, would, you would start looking at it as an observer going, man, I think Rob really has a problem. But if you took away the drugs word and said, no, I'm going surfing, then automatically the observer goes, oh, well, at least he's exercising, right? Yeah, but like, or I'm going to go exercise. You know, any, anything yeah. that has a good connotation, I think, I, yeah, that is your point. Yeah, I think, yeah, exactly. I think um, obviously surfing is good for many different systems in our body, our, uh, uh, our musculoskeletal system, our psychology, our cardiovascular system you know, our respiratory system. So there's a lot of good things that surfing brings to the table that um, obviously drugs don't. Uh, And I don't think that's much to argue about. But like, what about like, you go, okay, so surfing is something you got to do or else you're going to be a grumpy person. So now, now you start like you're not going to your son's little league game because you're surfing instead, or you're not going to go see your mother in law's you're not going to her birthday party because you'd rather be surfing. Yeah. Then, then I'd say like, yeah, that might be treading the line of an addiction that's now affecting other people negatively. And I, th- I think for me, as I've become older, I've been much more conscious of, uh, of that line, right? Like we all make sacrifices to go surfing with time away from our families. And ideally we come back a better person and bring better energy to you know, whoever we're around, but we all have to make that decision. And maybe for myself, uh, recognize where that line is between a good habit and a, in a, in an unhealthy addiction. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, positive or negative in yeah. front of that word, either habit or addiction, whatever you use. Yeah. Hey, it, you know what? I was thinking at least this week we're talking about surfing. Because <laughs> last week on the Dropping in Surf show where we're supposed to be talking about math and science and a lot of surfing, we somehow talked about baseball. Yeah, that was probably my fault. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what, man? I've got I've got more um, to talk about with baseball this week. Uh oh, just a little bit, and and I kind of want to revert back to episode one mm-hmm. uh, because we briefly touched on kicking when paddling into waves. I'm gonna I'm just gonna stick to paddling because that's my forte. So I'm gonna mm-hmm. talk a little mm-hmm. bit about that, and and I got an email this week from. A client who has taken level one, he's taken level two, um, and he got in a motorcycle accident, mm. and he's on his recovery, and he's like, he's like, I really need to get back out paddling, get out in the water, um, and and what did he say? He said, I got to work on my kicking because I'm terrible at it. Mm. And my response to him was, okay, first of all, if you recall from level one, in level one I have this eight step checklist, and it's all. It's all built upon the previous steps. Step eight is where I introduce kicking, mm-hmm. right? That means that you've got to be pretty good at the first seven. You're going to get most of your gains from the first seven. Kicking's just incrementally helping you a little bit better. And I said, listen, like that is not your focal point. You've got to work mm-hmm. on these other things first. Um, but you know, if you remember from that, from that study, uh, Journal of Sports Science, um, Loveless and Minahan did did um, measure kicking versus non-kicking in three different trials, and the results. You know, this is just one example, but the results were pretty astounding. Um, kicking provided ten percent higher velocity than non-kicking in the three three different trials, um, and they they go on to say that that could be you know over a five to seven a five to ten second burst speed. They're saying necessary to catch a wave. Basically, this 10% increase in velocity would provide you anywhere between a half of a meter to about a meter of a half advantage, Mm -hmm. which is huge because, you know, we talked about also in episode one was you really are trying to tap into that ramp early, that that incline ramp, uh, so that you can maybe catch the wave at, say, a 20 or 30 degree ramp rather than waiting to 45 or 50 degree Mm -hmm. ramp. And that just increases the likelihood that you're going to make the wave. Uh, and so a meter, a meter on average, let's say, is a huge advantage, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm here to talk to you about the science behind kicking. Because I, it gets, I get asked this question all the time. And I always end up reverting to a very short answer and then saying, hey, it's step number eight. And I've even had uh, clients who we work on kicking and their lateral balance is all off when they work on kicking. Um, so they are basically falling off their board. And it's like, well, you just added more drag than, <laughs> than you were trying to create in propulsion. So it's not, it's a total wash. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because kicking is a very interesting addition. Um, but I'm gonna start, start with swimming and then we'll get into on a surfboard. So in swimming, um, similar studies have been done over the years. So you're looking at an increase anywhere between 10 and 20% in velocity. Now, I've said in the past that a lot of the researchers still don't know how much of that is coming from from an actual increase in propulsive force in the backwards direction or how much of it is helping them just uh, reduce drag, right? So we know that what's contributing to that increase is a reduction of drag and increase in propulsion that is Mm -hmm. we do Mm -hmm. know that both of those are helping for swimming so it's these two combined so let's talk about the propulsion side first so the propulsion side is really interesting like what is actually providing thrust in the backwards direction right and here's where i'm going to bring in baseball Okay. I was waiting to see how this would Here we turn go. back to me. Here we go. <laughs> All so, right, I'm ready. What provides thrust are, uh, is, is, are these little vortices that get created. 
So when there's a wave, like there's a uh, peak and a crest in the way that the foot strikes the water, it's actually pushing water down and behind it is an empty cavity space. And when it goes up and down kind of like a wave, like undulates, it creates counter rotating vortices on, on uh, opposite sides of the foot or the object, right? That's creating that. So a good example is a pitching machine in baseball. You have one, one wheel that's rotating counterclockwise and you have the other that's rotating clockwise, right? And you, you put the ball in the middle and guess where it goes? Shoot, shoot straight out, right? So these vortices act very similarly, except that they're not right next to each other. Right. Uh -huh. So when the when the vector is going in the same direction, it shoots the ball out. Right. And frictions evolve. But for kicking, what happens is that one spin, one one of the spinning drums is offset a little bit higher or lower. And so it would be if we we're horizontal, it would be one would be in front, and one would be behind. But again, they're counter rote they're counter rotating. So at some point the vector is going in the same direction and it provides a certain thrust in the backwards direction. It's not exactly backwards. It's actually uh, it pushes the fluid, or in this case water, in the backwards direction but at an angle because it's it's offset. Then further down the line, there's another wave and there's another set of two vortices, also counter rotating also, but this time it's sending the thrust more up at a backwards upward diagonal. So if one was backwards downward diagonal, the other one's upward backwards diagonal. And what's happening is it's pushing fluid from basically the head of the swimmer. It starts actually from the head all the way down to the hips, all the way down to the upper leg, lower leg, and then the foot, all the way to the, 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 this whole wave that I'm talking about. It involves the entire body, not just the foot. Now, the more flexible your foot is, uh, the better you're going to get that tail end whip. And so it's just, it's pushing water from front to back. And here's another great example, a swimming eel. An eel moves and it slithers, right? So an eel, same, same thing, as it turns right or left, then it creates a vortice in that valley. Mm -hmm. And then as it turns the other way, it creates a vortice over here that's counter-rotating. It's going the opposite way. And it's just pushing water fluid from the head all the way down to the tail. And it creates backwards thrust, which then sends the eel forward. Okay, so that's another example is a free diving fin. You know those bit really long mm -hmm. fins? Mm -hmm. I, I could mm -hmm. say all fins, but the free diving fin is actual, uh, is a much better visual for a lot of people because it really bends. It's super long. And when you kick, it bends. And if you, if you look at images of proper finning technique, then they're using the entire leg as the extension of that quote unquote fin. And so the end of the fin is bent like a bell curve and then it follows the leg and then it, it reaches the butt and the butt is where it undulates, that's the valley, and then it comes back up to the body. And so you have this sine wave again and, and they do this, almost this dolphin kick. And even if you're doing single kicks, you're doing the same thing. You're actually undulating the body and you're creating this wave. So for those of you not watching, I'm, I'm kind of doing like this wave with my, with my arm. So does that make sense that that's what is actually providing thrust? It's actually pushing fluid from the top of the body all the way down to the toes. And you're trying to, the swimmer especially, is trying to coordinate their arms with that kick so that the fluid flows without any interruption from the head or actually from the fingertips all the way down to the toes. And so it hmm. creates that way because you're, you're, you're rotating your body while you're kicking. And so I'm a great example of it looking terribly <laughs> and not working. But you look at the Olympic swimmers, they coordinate their kicks with their arm strokes and the rotation of their body so beautifully that they're getting this 
they're getting this sine wave creating and, and it's add, adding tons of propulsive force out of the back. So a lot of people think, oh, it's, it's a person's foot. The longer the foot, the more propulsion, but that's not the case with swimmers. It's actually the coordination of the entire body from, from the top all the way down to the foot. Now I have terrible flexion in my ankle, as you know. And so like when I swam, my coaches were like, hey, why don't you kick? because you end up going faster. And so I'm, I'm doing my, my long sets and they're like, hey, why don't you don't, don't kick because you're going backwards. And mm -hmm. so when I, I would actually, in my longer events, when I didn't kick, I went faster than when I kicked. But in my, in my sprint events, when I kicked, I went faster. So here's the really interesting thing about that. What this is telling us is that I am, when I kick, I am not, getting propulsive force out the back but i am reducing drag so remember there's the the two sides of the equation there's is it providing propulsive force and it's usually combined with reducing drag so do you remember two weeks ago we talked about how when we're moving through water we actually create a wave we create a bow wave mm -hmm. and it, it makes a sine wave and at the back of that sine wave is usually where our feet are Right? When we are at maximum, our, when we're at our whole speed barrier and we're trying to break through that whole speed, remember when the, when the sine wave is as long as we are, uh, our water line is, then we've reached our whole speed. That's as fast as we can go before it takes an enormous amount of energy to basically override that bow wave that we've created, right? So at the very, at our feet typically, guess what? There's another wave happening behind us. It's called the stern wave. So they're the stern of the boat, right? So the stern of the vessel. So if we're going fast, we have hit our maximum hull speed and the wavelength is as long as our water line. And now if I kick, guess what happens? I'm breaking the stern wave. I'm, I'm, it's called wave cancellation. I'm, mm. I'm creating a new wave on top of the start of the stern wave with my foot. And that lifts that whole thing and it reduces the drag from that second wave that's pulling from behind. Mm -hmm. Isn't mm -hmm. that crazy? Mm -hmm. So when I sprint in my swim events, I went faster, not because I was adding propulsive force backwards, but because I was canceling the stern wave out and reducing drag. But in my longer events, my coaches said kick and then they're like, don't kick because you're terrible. That's a perfect example because when in my longer events, I wasn't at whole speed. I wasn't going fast enough. And so my kicking is supposed to provide backwards propulsion and it wasn't quite canceling out the, 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 the uh, sine wave because the sine wave, the, the stern wave was probably at like my knees. It wasn't at my feet. Does that make sense? It wasn't long enough because I wasn't going fast enough. So it's crazy, right? It is crazy. It's just kind of got me thinking like... Um... You know, you've talked about Newton's laws, and I don't know which one it is, but for uh, every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? Number three. Number three. That's number three. I knew you'd know that. Yeah. Um, I was just yeah. testing you. Yeah. <laughs> I was just testing you. And, and so, like, um, like, obviously, you have a swim background, and I don't, and this is how my uh, simple mind works, right? Like, so if we're paddling with our arms and we're pulling back, that's creating um, an opposite reaction to go forward, right? Because right. we're pushing back. And then if we kind of turn the axis and looked at the legs and they were doing kicking, wouldn't that be doing the same thing but going upward? Right. And then if we looked at like, like if this is my head here and I'm just doing a, a, a freestyle uh, swim in a pool with no kicking, like your, your body in the, your lower half is going to drag. And so using your terminology, your horizontal balance is just, I mean, you're, it's just taking up more space, right? So uh, the way my mind has kind of um, come around to that since, you know, talking with you and working with you is kicking might be a way to not necessarily provide propulsive force. And, I'm, I, and I definitely could be wrong there. You tell me what you think, but it's creating the back to lift up only to make you more streamlined from like a horizontal balance standpoint, which again makes the, the the system more efficient. Now, swimming's different, obviously, because you don't have a board, 
and when you're surfing or paddling, um, you have that board there so that sine wave you talk about is maybe a bit more um, negligible from our upper half. And so, you know, but like even I think even in some of your videos and your modules, like when you talk about horizontal balance, like this board, if this is the nose and the tail, it still might be just a little like that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the, Pitched you know, back a little bit. Yeah. yeah, it might be pitched back a little bit. And some of that depends maybe on the board or if you're not exactly like, you know, purchased with your chest in the exact sweet spot. And so maybe that kicking just does that, takes you from here to here only to make you more streamlined. Um, so, but no, you know, exactly. So I'm going to, I'm going to extend on that because a lot of people think that it's action reaction when you kick on a surfboard. So, so we've, mm -hmm. we've understood swimming now. Now let's take that same mindset towards paddling. Okay. And I'm going to start with just a short board and then I'm going to actually, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about long boards and prone boards too. So let's start with, with shortboard paddling, which is essentially assisted swimming because your body is in the water. Again, depending on how much of your body is in the water, that's your weight to volume ratio, which we've talked about on previous episodes as well. Super important to understand where you sit in the water. So how much of your body is actually submerged? If we were to look at the propulsive argument for swimming, what actually creates the propulsion? It's not the actual foot itself. It's the whole entire leg. It's the whole entire uh, body from your head all the way down to your toes. That creates that long undulating sine wave. Now in this sine wave, I'm talking about the vortices that we're creating, that we're trying to create, that provides backwards thrust, not the whole speed sine wave. I should be very clear about that. So when we look at paddling on a shortboard, there's not enough of our body in the water to create that, right? If we had flippers, maybe you got to think of, okay, well, how can we get that valley and how can we get that crest? Because that is what is creating the backwards thrust is the vortice creation. And you need a valley and you need a crest. Even just one would work, right? And when we're on a shortboard, we don't have enough real estate. There's just, it's just not there. We don't have enough of our body in the water, especially when we start getting up to speed and we get into that semi displacement mode that we talked about where you're, you're paddling maybe three miles an hour, 3.2. You're starting to get on that cusp of that whole speed barrier. And that, that now that wave sine wave that we talked about is as, almost as long as our wavelength. Now we're definitely actually higher in the water and even less of our bodies in the water. So what does kicking do then? That just means, and this is, nothing has been proven in paddling for this. This is Rob's theory that I want Griffith University and CSU San Marcos to test. But my theory is that kicking, when we kick in this journal of sports science, these results, that 10% increase in velocity, did not, not come from propulsion. It came solely from reduction in drag of the wave cancellation that's happening mm. at the feet. Mm. So you're canceling that, that way because typically that will happen when they're at sprint speeds, right? And so that's my thought is that that is what is happening. And to your point, not only will the action or the reaction be up from the action of kicking down, but we're also canceling that stern wave, mm -hmm. which also reduces drag. So you're getting twofold you're getting the back part of your board up higher and you're canceling that stern wave that's kind of pulling you back. Nah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's my theory. Now that's for short boards, right? Mm -hmm. What about long boards and prone boards? Mm. Right? They're, they're, their legs aren't even in the water. And I teach longboard paddling in that step eight as well. Mm -hmm. Now that's a different beast altogether because you can provide per forward propulsion in two ways on a longboard or paddleboard, right? So let's think about this. One is we need some sort of action reaction. So you've seen longboard, you know, you've seen me kick on longboards where I kind of whip, whip my heel to my butt. Mm -hmm. So if you were mm -hmm. to just do that on the ground, just, just on the ground in your living room and you were to whip your heel to your butt, your body's going to lurch forward mm -hmm. because there's this mm -hmm. transfer of momentum from the energy used in your foot and or your leg that transfers to your body 
And then if you're attached to a board that is not on a stationary surface, guess what? That board moves forward as well. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. one source of propulsion. It's just the whipping effect, the momentum force of your leg whipping forward. The second area is, once again, undulation. You're actually creating a vortice, and you see it more if you watch the prone paddle boarder's knee paddle. You'll see it a lot in knee paddling because it's a double arm paddle. What they'll do is they'll lean forward and they'll depress the front part of the board into the water and the tail kind of comes up, right? So what have they just created? They've created the valley and the crest. Mm -hmm. The front part of the board is the valley, the back part of the board is the crest. And even though it's not quite you know, out of the water, it has now created a really flat kind of sine wave. It's long and it's flat. And then they take their stroke and then they lean back on their heels and boom, they, they basically spit that out the back of their board. And now the front of the board is the, is the crest and the back of the board is the valley. Okay, so now let's think about this from the vortice point of view. Where are the vortices? Well, we can think very clearly about, okay, maybe, maybe there's a vortice being created when they depress the front of the board and they lift the back of the board as they reach in, there's a vortice right under them, like in the back part, right? So what's the counter rotating vortice? Well, it's not water. There always has to be one. It's air. All right, so you have, a, you have air moving around where your body is and then you have water moving, counter rotating that. And the reason why you don't get as much propulsion out of that undulation effect is because water is much more dense than air. And so it's almost like you have on the baseball spinning wheel or the, the self pitcher, it's like you have one wheel moving faster than the other. And so you kind of get the ball's going to go kind of sideways at that point, right? So that's kind of what's happening with the undulation. You're not getting a purely backwards propulsive thrust happening because of the different densities of the air and the water you're getting it sort of sideways, but it's still in the backwards direction, which is pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. So there you go, you got, you got undulation and you've got momentum force when you kick, right? And then in addition to that, you reduce drag by kicking as well because you're lifting that, uh, you're lifting it up out of the water for that moment. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's super cool. Uh, it, uh, there's a lot of um, moving parts there and yeah, it's like literally, literally. Yeah. There's like, and and here's the other thing is is uh, what I typically teach initially with longboard paddling or paddleboard paddling is right now we have we have two propulsive mechanisms. We have our two arms, right? So if you above water kick like the scorpion kicks with your legs, guess what? Now you've got four, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. if you can reduce the amount of deceleration that you have between using any one mechanism of propulsion you're now going to have a higher consistent speed across the board. So you go right arm in, left kick, it's one, two, mm -hmm. and then right kick, left arm in, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you have this alternating instead of boom, 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 right, left, right, left, right, left, right? You have boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. Now you have four sources mm -hmm. of propulsion, one after the other after the other. And that's where you really kick out. The only downside of all this is that kicking uses up energy, right? And so the general rule there is then only use it when you need the extra speed. And you'll see me above water kick even on my shortboard. And I have, I have certain reasons why I do that from time to time too. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> you can definitely feel it if you guys haven't um, tried that. Like I, I probably personally feel what Rob's talking about on my... 12 foot prone paddleboard and if you just get it in flat water it, you could you could really um gain a sensitivity for what he's talking about and just kind of play around with like that scorpion kick in the tempo you're doing with your upper extremities and it almost happens and rob would curious to hear your thoughts on this like walking right like when we walk our left leg comes forward our right hand comes forward and it happens like automatically it's not same same you know what i mean yeah and if if you did try to walk with the left hand and the left foot coming forward i mean try to do that it's very awkward 
And there's something maybe, um, you know, to kind of like really complicate the mechanism you're talking about, about this like, you know, the complicated biomechanists would 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 re, would refer to this as like a spiral, um, like energy transfer. So like if if the right foot or heel was coming towards the buttock as a left um, hand was entering the water, the spine is creating this like the upper portion would be going in the left rotation as the bottom portion would be going in the right rotation. And we'd kind of like be doing exactly what you were talking about um, it with your other examples. Oh, so, I love that. I never even thought about that, about what's but, happening to the spine during that. That's great. Yeah, and, and I mean, if you kind of tie it back to like, how does a human being generate the most force? It's again, with that stretch shortened cycle, which is essentially what you're describing. Mm, you know, and, that, I, and to get away it, from paddling for a minute, that same thing could probably be said about any turn in surfing. Oh, totally. Or baseball. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> well that's 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 all baseball is right yeah. like you're you're trying to generate um inertia or momentum so like what does a pitcher do he goes into a wind up wind up and then he he goes posterior he compresses and compresses all the tissue as he stretches all the uh, uh contralateral or anterior tissue and then he pushes out of it and does the opposite and shortens the things that were stretched and elongates the things that were um compressed and that essentially is like a, an eccentric spring, right? And the batter would do the same thing. See, I'm doing this on purpose to be annoying, <laughs> to talk about baseball more, because you said we did it too much last time. <laughs> no, but like a batter uh, would do the same thing. So he would time the ball coming in, and he would go back before he went forward, right? right? And right. it's the same kind of thing. And you could probably nitpick any sport that requires power or an explosive maneuver and watch what people do and it's going to be some form of a stretch shortened cycle whether it happens on the what we call the sagittal plane and so that would be like a volleyball player going down and extending up to jump as high as he or she could right it could happen on what we call the side to side or the frontal plane and that would be that pitcher going compressing and pushing lateral to generate force that way or it could be on what we call the transverse plane which is kind of like um what we just talked about with the spine maybe going through this rotation now to kind of add into that one two or three of those um cardinal planes of motion could be happening in a combined form oh yeah absolutely you know? when when a batter starts to move forward it's lower body mm -hmm. hips upper body follow through golf Surfers love yep. golf. But yeah, same thing, right? There's a ton of that happening. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so it's pretty interesting to think about, um, you know, to really kind of tie it back to like good coaching, um, like it might just be a like a, a sense of feel too. Like I'll, I personally feel it on a prone paddleboard and there's something about the rhythm that it makes where I know I'm going faster and once I find my rhythm, I can scorpion kick as I'm paddling and I just know I'm going faster because I can feel it. Yeah. And then if I purposely play with it, that's like the, um, the, the, the tinker or in me is I go, okay, let me like mess this up a little bit. Let me go. Same, same. Let me go right kick with right arm. And it feels really kind of clunky because you're kind of losing some of that like coupled motion of the spine where things are trying to like, you know, meet rotation in the middle. And now they're just kind of spilling, right? Because they're rotating together. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, debating or arguing about the mechanism for why something happens is like, it's super fun to do. Uh, and, and it's cool because like, I mean, that's like, that's like the mathematician in you. That's the scientist in me. That's curiosity pr uh, uh, promoting um, maybe future research to, uh, per our uh, conversation last week, kind of like justify that some of these things uh, happen. And um, there's a whole lot of unknowns too, maybe. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really like, uh, I really like how you explain that. Um, you know, um, I've been it, meaning to It gives us a reason to go play baseball too. Cross, yeah, cross training. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Exactly. I just pretty much... Pretty much, we're going to turn all surfers from golf lovers into baseball lovers. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or cricket, if you're in Australia. 
Yeah. I, I don't know. I ju- I'm just a baseball guy, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, I, I wanted to uh, kind of share something with you and, um, <clears throat> you know, taking it back to maybe that, um, the, the usage of kicking and paddling. Um, so those of you know, we're in these like, these COVID restrictions where um, local beaches are closed. And so long story short, I went a period of time without surfing and then um, just started kind of re-engaging in surfing again and started uh, picking boards out of my quiver that I hadn't ridden in, you know, long time, months and, um, and found myself um, throughout the session trying to like recalibrate my boards like each board like recalibrate the sweet spot of where to be positionally on my board and and I was just kind of playing with it like um you have a really simple drill that um surfers should check out in one of your modules of just finding like I think you call it the sweet spot like where your head's down and your arms are back and then your head's down and your arms are behind you and essentially you're looking for where that board balances horizontal so if you're too far back with your chest uh, the nose of the board might come up a little bit and vice versa. If you're too far forward, it might come down a little bit. Am I explaining that? Absolutely. And right. I would just add that there's a range, right? So if you right. have a really low volume board, it's like the fulcrum is just the tippy, the tip of a triangle. Whereas with a long board, the fulcrum's got a little bit more leniency, mm-hmm. let's say. Bigger range. Yeah. yeah. And so I've been kind of playing with that range right like I've, I've been kind of purposely spilling the board forward and backwards to kind of find where that threshold is like what's the top end um, of my range and what's the bottom end towards the tail part of my range so like in other words for those of you who can't see what I'm doing how much up and down or nose to tail wiggle room can I have with my chest and, and and get a and get a kinesthetic awareness for like what's that sweet spot because i feel like i feel like just knowing that like if you're just in that sweet spot especially on a shortboard like where where the real estate is so That's like so what small. you what you said like yeah. a triangle i mean if you're an inch or two off that triangle i mean you could have everything else nailed but you're still plowing water yeah it's hypersensitive yeah, but like maybe maybe if you're right there, like maybe you can err a little bit on some of the other mechanics if you had to. But like you've kind of set yourself up for more success. And yeah, I like that. That's cool. How'd it go? And how'd, how'd it feel when you were playing around with it? It felt really good. And like, um, like again, it's subjective. But like, you know, I felt like so. Here would be a practical example, right? Like. Let's say um, you're you're going to like catch a wave and you had to turn and spin really quick because you were just you just had to be in that one spot and you didn't have a lot of time and the board kind of like squirts up on your chest and that might mess up your pop up like you know a problem of mine is if like the board squirts too far forward now maybe my front foot is like behind the sweet spot when I go to stand up and now I'm kind of doing this wheelie slowing down plowing water. But if I can get a sense of like that happening really quick and put my chest on the back end of that sweet spot or somewhere in that sweet spot, I know by the time I pop up, I'm more likely to have that foot more in the sweet spot of where like the front and back rocker lines might meet. Right. You know, so if we kind of had to like look at board design and again, I'm not a shaper, but like I'll try to do this in a really um, simple fashion, but where the front and the back rocker lines meet might be around where rob's talking about where the triangle is for the sweet spot yeah could be maybe could maybe be. more modern day um kind of gravel boards or small wave boards might have like the belly of the board be more flat right so you have rocker flat rocker out the back more high performance boards are probably more rocker to rocker like i think stretch calls it a spherical rocker mm-hmm Right, and then other guys might have more nose, more tail, or less tail, or vice versa, depending on the theory. But um, kind of getting to know that kind of sweet spot in what like the um, middle portion of your board is doing, rocker wise, maybe might give you more real estate there. But I really think that sets everything else up. Like if you get an awareness for what your chest is doing, get the paddling going, and then had to turn and spin and get your feet there. It all goes A to B to C to D, right? Like 
if you're behind the sweet spot when you go to turn around and paddle to take off, now your whole awareness for it to pop up is like your foot's going to probably st- step behind that um, kind of sweet spot. So I feel like to, 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 to your point, um, it, I feel like having that extra awareness, which I never really thought about in those terms in like 25 years of surfing, right? Mm-hmm. And and I probably started thinking that more more like that recently in like the last six to eight months, um, especially recently with, you know, reintegrating and refamiliarizing myself with my old boards. I hadn't ridden in a while and uh, I, I felt like I had a different sense of awareness with each board that I was, I was gaining more and more an appreciation of as the session went on. Yeah. Cause if that makes you know, sense. Yeah. To- totally. Because when you're, when you're riding the same boards over and over again, or bored, if you just ride one, you, you really, you tune into that sweet spot very easily. But you take a break from it for a while. It does take a little bit of kind of reintroduction to that board. I love how you mm-hmm. you explain that. One of the things that I try to describe to clients is if you just let your board sit in flat water and looked at it from the side, from mm-hmm. that horizontal position, how does it sit naturally? Mm-hmm. And that's going to help you key in on that flat part of the board where the rockers meet or if it's a continuous rocker all the way through. You know, how does it sit without weight on it? Where's the center of gravity? And then once you get on it, where's the new center of gravity? You know, we talked about it either last week or the week before. I always describe once you're on that board, you are a part of that vessel. You're now, mm-hmm. You've now changed that center of gravity. You've now changed the center of mass. So how do you work within that board? And so I love that you, you brought that up. And I could even say... You know, if, if I were talking to a shaper right now, shapers always describe boards that paddle beautifully. And yeah, maybe it's because they have a flatter mid part, less rocker, right? And, and again, mm-hmm. I'm, 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 I'm more clueless than you are when it comes to board design. But what I will say is that no board was designed to paddle well. You know, if someone says, oh, this thing paddles like a dream, BS. I call BS because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not even designed to paddle well. It's mm-hmm. designed to turn well. Right, and, and mm-hmm. you look at a paddle board that is like the shearwater board or the bark boards, you know that those things you can look at the way that it's shaped, it is designed to move through water quickly, but they turn like crap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen to like anyone say uh, a board is a good paddler and ask them why, and, and they'll say things like, Oh, I got all this uh, foam under my chest. Yeah. Right. And so, okay, so maybe we're talking width, maybe we're talking thickness. What we might not be seeing are where the rocker lines meet or where where is flat. Maybe I would say like, so uh, <clears throat> without promoting a bunch of boards, there are some websites that will take you through the rocker lines um, where they'll look at the front. They'll do like almost like a CAD drawing where, you know, the, the front rocker looks like this, the back rocker looks like this, the middle rocker is maybe flat or they meet, right? And the gravel boards, the tendency is to have more flatness in the like chest area. And um, you and what almost... does that provide them? We talked about this two weeks ago. Archimedes principle, man. Yeah. You know, it's more buoyant force upward. Right. That gets you up out of the water. And that's why it paddles better. It's just removing right. you from the equation more. Yeah. So like if, a good, if you have more of that, right, like you could probably get away being less aware of like the triangle on the shortboard because there's more room for error, right? Like, so you could just plop down on that thing and go, ah, this feels okay. That feels okay. And it probably is okay. Yeah. Right. But like the more maybe high performance the board is with less of that, the more maybe uh, you need to develop um, that kinesthetic awareness. And that drill I'm talking about seems very rudimentary, but like I would implore any beginning intermediate or even advanced surfer to just revisit or try that drill and just gain an appreciation for what your specific board's horizontal balance point is and just learn what that feels like and 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 do it throughout a session um and then just see how it affects your surfing and um i think you'll be surprised it'll affect the way you feel paddling It'll affect your confidence with late drops. It might affect uh, how quickly you're able to put your uh, your front foot in the sweet spot. 
Um, those are all things that I kind of picked up on um, or just maybe a little bit more on the screws once I started kind of tapping into that yeah. concept. I love that you, you, you described the sweet spot, not just from paddling, because I always use sweet spot as paddling, but there's a sweet spot on every board where yeah. your front foot should go and you'll feel that fulcrum when you're riding. And that's, again, getting back to boat surfing. Boat surfing has provided me the time to dial in that sweet spot on all the boards that I have. Because you're mm -hmm. you're not you're not only up for five seconds, you're up for five minutes, <laughs> and you can play around with that. You can pr play around with the pressures, and and how they affect your foot, for example, for me. Yeah. But, um, yeah, man, I love that. I love that conversation. I gotta we gotta move on though because once oh, again yeah. we're we're flying through this. Um, yep. Sponsors, thank you, Salty PT. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, <laughs> and surfingpaddling.com, <laughs> and thank you, Red House Kitchen IB. Um, a restaurant down in South San Diego. Make sure you guys support the 655 ocean-friendly restaurants like uh, Red House Kitchen in IB uh, is. Um, our last segment, dude, I'm calling No Surf, No Problem. So things you do to get your fix when the surf is bad. Go. Mm. Physically, mentally, Man, it's and it's open to interpretation. It's open. Yeah. Yeah. There's no well, I, there's no segment police here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when when I was younger it, it used to be um mountain biking and like kinda of like, it's like Marin. Dirt, yeah, like dirt yeah. jumping, um, riding illegal trails and kinda of getting <laughs> like maybe an adrenaline rush that way. Um and then um I, I fell hard a couple times and uh one of the falls fractured the top part of my pelvis. And so from that, like I've really become a bit more gun shy with uh, that kind of biking. But I, I, I definitely love just getting on um, uh, my, my cross bike, which is just a bike I commute to work with. And I love just going for a ride and, and, and almost meditating as I do that. Like, yeah. like if I'm not surfing and I'm getting some sort of like movement exercise, it's either strength training with weights or some sort of biking cardiovascular exercise and um to me that really helps me decompress and i don't know if it gives me the same fix that i'm craving for um when i go surfing but kind of like i alluded to earlier a big maybe personal problem i had when i was younger was like just wanting to go surf 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 and in and, and like getting really bummed out on days I wouldn't go and hearing about how good they were or I was working and the <laughs> surf was going off and like I mean it, it used to be a real problem like oh, you know when we were kids that was always such a big deal yeah that we weren't yeah. on it. it 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 frustrated us why oh why yeah. so much now we're yeah. older we know better <laughs> yeah yeah now they call it they call it FOMO Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, I had I, I had a bad case of FOMO, and then um, maybe having kids changes you. But like I think as I aged, like I'm much more content knowing okay, like this is my time. I have a better relationship with surfing. It's not as addictive as it is now a good <laughs> habit. And so um, days of the week where I know I don't have time to surf. Uh, Biking and lifting weights does something for me that kind of like satiates that um, kind of thing. You know, and speaking of biking, because, you know, I've, growing up in Marin, we mountain bike too, but I wasn't that hardcore into it. But there's a bike park uh, that has a pump track. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. those pump, I've, I've gone on those pump tracks before, and man, that feels great. That feels like you're generating speed without pedaling and it's you're banking off the turns that I can see. I know a lot of surfers up here in Marin will mountain bike when it's not mm -hmm. so good. Mm -hmm. Um, that's wild, man. Yeah. And that goes back to your, like your, uh, your wave, right? right? Like yeah. just pumping a bike to, to keep momentum is essentially yeah. this same thing we were just talking about. I think the premise of this question too, uh, I was thinking about it. I wrote down a couple for me, and then I was like, "Wait a minute, Jim and I get in the water no matter what. I'm like we're always we always bring like ten boards, and between yeah. the between the two of us, we'll find something to do in mm -hmm. the water. So this mm -hmm. is when, for some reason, we can't get to the beach. I should rename it because even mm -hmm. when the surf's bad, we always have something to ride out there. 
Oh yeah, totally. Like, yeah, if if it's a Sunday between nine and eleven, I'm going surfing no matter what. Right? <laughs> and 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 that and, and I think we I mentioned that before. It's like yeah, you can have a hand plane. Um, uh, I have a buddy that lent me an air mat or a surf mat that Dude, I still have in Do you remember? You, do. Val? you remember oh, yeah. Val? Yeah, she got yeah. me hooked on that. Yeah, those are hard. Yes. They're really yeah. hard. So like, I I just kind of love like. There, there's certain crafts out there that let you um, explore different days and give you different um, feels, sense, yeah, different sensations yeah. you haven't felt before. And like one of my uh, one of my patients actually, um, he had some time time on his hand with the COVID stuff, and he made me a, a pipo board out of nowhere. Nice. And and he he calls me up uh, because we became buddies, and he's like, hey, I was bored, so I was thinking of you, and I made you this. I'm like, whoa, that's really awesome. And again, that's like a whole new, like, like sensation. And for me, that's like, I mean, there's nothing more fun than like getting in the water and trying to tinker with a, a new craft and trying to figure out what it does. Yeah. And um, like it, that whole uh, thing client, is just. Sorry to cut you off, but oh, another so good. client I was so excited about because you said Pipo. I was, I was going to bring it the next time we got together. And I was going to whip it out because the client left his pipo board here after boat surfing. He's like, yeah, I just leave it at the house. I'll, I'll use it when I come back. So I'm told he's like, yeah, use it, use it whenever you want. Oh, so I'm, I was going to pull it out. We'll go pipo. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah the, the heavies will love, the, the heavies will love us when we, uh, when we roll up and we're just well, like trying to dominate. We're not going to do it on an epic deck. Come on. Now. I might. Well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe near the end of our session. Yeah. 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 And for then, me, uh, yeah. What about you? Yeah. yeah what about you? Say, with, for um, me, um, my water fix is swimming and paddling just back here, which is nice. In terms of surf fix, I'm lucky. I get to. I I can boat surf when I can find a driver. Um, I sail. Sailing gives me that fix. Supping, kind of like on a downwind, kind of gives me that fix because um, you can get some speed on it. The carver board. Definitely mm-hmm. gives me that fix. Um, but yeah, I think, and then indoor board busu ball, like if I'm really in a bind and I can't, but pretty much even if it's raining, like if it's windy, I'm either sailing or supping. Whereas my wife, like she's like, what's the wind going to be like tomorrow? She doesn't want any wind when she subs. And I like find the windiest time of the day to go because <laughs> you get the mm-hmm. workout on the way up and then you get the, uh, the cruising on the way back. Uh, but one thing that I might and dude don't don't tell Lori this because she's gonna get pissed if I add another toy to the arsenal here. But um, you know the um, oh, what do they call them? Uh, they're they're kites, but um, but you hold on to them um, like yeah. a boom. Is that the, the the wing surfing? The wings. The wing surfing. Yes, the wing yeah. surfing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did we talk about this already? We did uh, uh, maybe two sessions ago or okay. something. Yeah, we, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm I'm definitely thinking about a wing, a wing kite now, or a wing. I, I think you should do that. Yeah, yeah. And it, and and you can you can collapse it because they inflate, and you can hide it so Lori will never find it. <laughs> Honey, I'm just going out for a sub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean I like when I do these sup these sup downwinds out here, I just put my paddle sideways and it pulls me, dude. I mean it's it's got some some wind here. So having mm-hmm. a having a, uh, a kite um it's going to be insane. And I've never really got into windsurfing um but this I could probably get into and maybe maybe if I get good at on a sup I could possibly Put a foil under me and try it but that'd be cool yeah we'll see that'd be cool i think um i know we're trying to wrap up here but i think what i really <laughs> i what i really enjoy like and you can share this two with Lori, hours later yeah like, <laughs> is is jim still talking about the biopsychosocial model when someone shut that guy up something about the shoulder and yeah um <clears throat> so you, yeah th- last word last word go for it last word is um i think what i really appreciate is um doing things in uh, non-optimal conditions, just generally speaking. Like I love, um, like I went fishing in the rain the other day and, and it was like, I did it because it was like I had the time and uh, 
I knew it wasn't ideal, but that becomes the challenge is like, okay, you have to wear certain clothes and like slosh through the mud and, um, took my son fishing and, um, like same thing with biking. Like I love biking in the wind because like, you know, it's just like, it's in your face and, and surfing when it's marginal or, or kind of crappy, like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm down to do that because it's those elements just open up a whole new opportunity for challenge and, and growth almost, and growth. Yeah. Right? And challenge so, ends up leading to growth every time. That's it. I've been trying to teach my kids that they won't listen to me though. So maybe, maybe uncle Jim will have to come over and <laughs> listen kids. <laughs> Yeah, I can be uh, that second uncle you had that like shakes their hand and like puts them on their knees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff, man. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks man. again for your time. Thank you guys for watching and listening. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions, um, Jim, how do they get a hold of you? What's probably the best way? Yeah, they can email me through my blog site, which is saltypt.com, and just go to the contact me and. You can shoot me an email there. There you go. So if you if you want a session with Jim, shoot him an email. Or if you have a question, um, same with me. We're opening up June first, man, and I'm excited. I got a backlog of surfers that I got to get to, and then um, I'll be taking taking new clients on. So very excited. Cross your fingers. Keep that yeah. COVID out. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's gonna come through. I'm just gonna spray them with disinfectant. Mm -hmm. Spray me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's all good though man it'll be fun alright guys well you guys have a wonderful week we'll talk to you next week see ya thanks guys